So, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this the sort of final session uh, of, this, of this meeting, prior, of course, to the William Smith Lecture. Now, the talks in this session take us, you know, far away in, in time and in, in space from what we've been dealing with pretty much thus far. So, the first two talks are on uh, plate tectonics or indications of plate tectonics uh, or similar matters on other planets or on moons. So, you know, we're moving from Earth elsewhere in the, in the solar system. So, first of all, Catherine Johnson from the University of British Columbia, and she's going to talk about tectonics beyond Earth, no plates, different states. Thank you. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, say a big thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's a big honor to be invited to uh, speak at, at this meeting. And when I received the introduction, uh, the, the invitation, um, it said something like, uh, perhaps we could persuade you to talk about tectonics on other planets, data and inferences from missions, the implications of that, and the similarities and, and differences compared with the Earth. <laughs> so, 25 minutes. <laughs> so, I'm going to tell a couple of stories. Um, and, uh, and I'll describe what those are in just a minute. But for some context, uh, we've heard a lot this week about plate tectonics on Earth. And of course, it was discovered um, because of clever ideas, but because of the availability of really diverse geophysical and geological data sets. And we all know, that, of course, that plate tectonics is extremely important in the heat budget of our own planet. It provides very efficient cooling of the mantle. And as a result, there are thin thermal boundary layers, namely the lithosphere and the core mantle boundary region. We haven't heard too much about that this <coughs> week. But it's very important in terms of planetary evolution because it is the boundary to the core and uh, determines the heat loss that uh, can happen from the core into the mantle. So when we move beyond the Earth, uh, we have a completely different situation. I'm going to talk about uh, other planets in our solar system. I'm going to restrict this talk to uh, planets, bodies in the inner solar system. And in fact, specifically, we're going to look at Venus and Mercury. The data sets are much more limited. They are, of course, mostly remotely sensed observations from satellites, either flybys or orbital observations. Um, in the case of Mars and the Moon, we have meteorites, so we do have samples. In the case of the Moon, we have returned samples. Those have been very important for planetary uh, endeavors. And in the case of the Moon, there's seismic observations. But in general, we're restricted to remotely sensed <coughs> observations that limits the resolution with which we can see the surface and image the interior. And probably even with those types of data sets, I would say that the major, one of the major challenges for looking at other planets is the issue of chronology. How do you decide what happened when in any kind of absolute sense, uh, never mind a relative sense. So the goal of this, of course, is to try to understand a uh, planet's current state and its evolution to that state. In terms of modeling, um, these kinds of models are not what I spend my time doing. I, I spend time a little bit closer to the observations. But the goal is to be able to provide from the observations quantitative constraints for these kinds of models. And I've grouped them into two types here. The first is sort of 1D thermal evolution models that enable us to make predictions for essentially heat flow and temperature as a function of time, predictions for mantle melting, crustal production, things like that. Although very simple parameterized models, these have been very successful in being able to describe at least first order um, properties of many of the uh, inner bodies, uh, bodies of the inner solar system. If we want instead to really think about the plan form of convection, uh, the details of mantle mixing, in fact, to get a better idea of where melting is happening over time, then of course we need uh, two-dimensional or three-dimensional um, models. And uh, these kinds of mantle convection models have been applied to other planets. And probably the area that needs the most attention and is the most critical for understanding other planets is incorporating um, 
lithospheric rheologies into those to understand how lithospheres deform and possibly anneal. And from these kinds of models, um, what we infer <coughs> is that if the convective stresses in a planetary mantle are typically are bigger than the lithospheric yield stresses, then we might expect to have a situation where we have plate tectonics. If they're less, then we might expect to have a situation where we have a stagnant lid um, and possibly convection uh, beneath that, st that stagnant lid. That is thought to be the case, for example, for Mars over longer times, even just a planet that, or a body that's cooling conductively for example, Mercury and probably the moon uh, today. One of the big questions has always been our neighbor uh, planet Venus. Um, how does it uh, lose heat uh, today? And is it similar or different from the Earth? So I'm going to talk uh, here about essentially two stories, one from uh, Venus. Uh, and I worked on this uh, with several other people um, really quite a long time ago. Now, and what I want to do is really just paint a picture for you of what I think uh, the present day interior state is of Venus from different kinds of observations. And then we'll turn to the innermost planet in our solar system, Mercury. And um, that's in part because it's uh, a body that I've been working on recently. Um, and for Mercury, we'll look at some constraints on the early evolution of Mercury that's useful for these kinds of um, models here. So I wanted to talk about Venus in part because I have a link to Dan McKenzie um, through this. In fact, when I was first a graduate student at Scripps working on Magellan with uh, David Samwell, um, who many of you here know, <laughs> The uh, Magellan mission had just started, and they had monthly science team meetings at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And most people didn't take their grad students, but we were just down the road. And so the second of these meetings, Dave said to me the day before the meeting, oh, why don't you just go up? Um, I might come later, which I, I quickly learned was code for I'm going surfing. <laughs> <laughs> so I drove up, and, and uh, you know, I was a beginning graduate student. I was very nervous. I got there incredibly early to make sure that I wasn't late. And the only other person in the room was Dan. And Dan came over to me right away, and he said, hello, I'm Dan McKenzie, as though I might not know. <laughs> and of course I did, even though we didn't have the web back then for pictures. And um, Dan was an incredibly supportive, in fact, of uh, my own uh, role and research, really looking out for me, I think, as a, as a young person, um, as a graduate student, on a team with a lot of um, big names uh, doing work uh, pretty quickly. Um, so I owe uh, Dan a lot uh, in my career from my early days. OK, so some essentials about Venus, if you don't think about Venus every day. Uh, this is as close as we're going to get to an outcrop picture in this talk. Um, so this is the link to this morning. Sorry, that's it. Um, but amazing pictures, in fact, from the Soviet Venera landers in the 1980s. Um, they lasted uh, around about an hour on the surface of Venus and, and relayed uh, very important information on the composition of the surface, basically basaltic. It has a thick carbon dioxide dry atmosphere and so very different surface uh, conditions from our own Earth. No present day global magnetic field. This is probably a very, very important diagnostic of the interior state of the planet. And we'll look here mostly at observations returned by the Magellan mission to Venus um, uh, between 1990 and 1994. So a quick tour of Venus physiography. This is a, a uh, elevation map of the surface of Venus here in kilometers. About 80% of the planet lies within the mean, uh, within one kilometer of the mean elevation. And there are a variety of um, physiographic features that are sometimes similar to things that we see on Earth. These broad topographic rises here, you can just see um, in, this, uh, in the topography Evidence for rifts, sometimes with volcanism associated with them. This one here, uh, splitting a crater in half. Evidence for topographic plateaus, the interior of which is highly deformed. And some others, uh, this one in particular, where the interior is not deformed, but things that look like mountain belts surrounding it. 
these broad lowland regions, which are volcanic uh, plains that have um, compressional features in many of them, and some features that are unique to Venus among the terrestrial planets, features that are um, more or less circular, defined originally by this annulus of concentric fractures, um, more than 500 of them globally. This is the global distribution. Huge range in their sizes, 60 to um, about 2,000 kilometers in diameter. And we'll come back to uh, what these might tell us or why they might be important in a little bit. OK, so when Magellan first uh, sent back images from Venus, in fact, some of the things I'm going to tell you were known before Magellan from even lower resolution observations. But one of the most important things was the observations of craters on the surface. So in the absence of radiometric dates, one of the ways in which planetary scientists assign ages to surface, at least relative ages, is through the distribution, size distributions, and spatial densities of impact craters. Surprising things from Magellan was that there are relatively few impact craters on the surface of Venus. Um, and that unlike on the Moon, on Mars, on Mercury, their geographical distribution is indistinguishable from one that's completely spatially random. Also, very few of them were tectonically modified. You saw one that was split apart in the previous image. That's the only one that looks like that. Very few of them tectonically or <coughs> volcanically modified. So this led to the um, interpretation that the average age of the surface was young because there aren't many craters. And statistically, it's not possible to really distinguish areas that are relatively older and areas that are relatively younger. So this sequence of observations um, was very important, but it led to the community becoming really quite stuck for quite a long time. And part of the reason was this. Um, to try to explain this average surface age, there were some M-member hypotheses put forward. The first was uh, a model that was referred to a CRM, catastrophic resurfacing model, which uh, hypothesized that about the average age of the surface ago, so about 750 million years ago, the Venus experienced an um, intense resurfacing period. And since then, nothing really has happened on the surface except accumulating impact craters. Other end member models were ones in which you're able to resurface the surface, but you have to do it at a spatial scale that is smaller than the average intercrater distance. And these types of models then led to some sort of 1D mostly geophysical interpretations, mainly because catastrophic things are lots of fun to model. Um, so from a geophysics perspective, there were some models proposed that involved for example, just basically remaking the entire lithosphere 750 million years ago, letting it cool conductively until some point where the lithosphere becomes negatively buoyant and unstable, triggering essentially global delamination of the lithosphere. This is, of course, great fun to model because you can take some of the tools that we have for the Earth and try to decide whether lithospheric thickness today and if you can estimate it for times in the past for Venus matches the predictions of these models. And this ran into all sorts of problems, mainly because of this issue of establishing ages. It's very difficult to, although there are um, estimates of lithospheric thickness from the ty types of tools and techniques we use on the Earth, so admittance studies, which pertain to lithospheric thickness today, but flexure, which topographic flexure, which <coughs> pertains to a time at which that flexural signature was acquired, um, were really devoid of good age constraints. So here we're just going to take a step back and actually look at an alternative approach. And I think there's, um, there already was evidence, and there's um, more and more supporting evidence that, in fact, Venus is a volcanically and tectonic tectonically active planet. Um, it has some processes that are similar to those on the Earth, but some important differences. And so we'll look at just these uh, five things here. First of all, the lithosphere on Venus is strong, it's dry, but it clearly breaks. 
And Dan, in fact, pointed this out right at the very beginning of the Magellan mission. In fact, this is the first paper that I was ever an author on. Um, Dan uh, pointed out that there are features on Venus that look like features that we see at plate boundaries on the Earth. Um, one we talked about previously, and this was actually not the subject of Dan's paper, is that there are things that look like rifts, but they look more like continental rifts than mid-ocean ridges. Then there are features that look in plan form very similar to some subduction zones that we see on the Earth. This is the Earth. This is Venus. And they have flexural profiles in their topography that can be interpreted in terms of elastic lithospheric thicknesses that are not actually dissimilar to those that we obtain um, in some places for the Earth. Dan also noticed, um, this is not a figure from his paper, this is from more recent work by uh, Paul Byrne et al., that there was evidence, at least in one place, and since then it's been recognized in other places, for lateral shear. But there's no connected system of plate boundaries. This was actually tested um, and sh even before Magellan, um, shown, for example, that the topography um, doesn't fit a plate cooling model as you go away from topographic highs on Venus. So there, there is clearly a strong lithosphere. It can break, but it doesn't break in a way that then permits um, plate tectonics. There's been a lot of recent work, and this is now actually with Venus Express um, uh, observations. <coughs> Venus Express has a near-infrared uh, instrument on it. And there are several observations, basically, of increased temperatures um, in the uh, near-infrared. Uh, several different studies, well, a couple of them here, um, and uh, one that pertains to longer time periods. Um, but the suggestion for all of, from all of these studies is that locally there are higher temperatures or um, uh, observations seen in the emissivity that have been interpreted essentially of recent volcanism. In this case, um, not very, very recent, um, but in this case, uh, actually changes in temperature that are substantial between different orbits passing over the same region. So suggestions that, in fact, there may be recent, um, possibly current volcanism on the planet. The um, third uh, line of evidence that Venus certainly has um, mantle convection and dynamic supportive topography comes from the correlation of the long wavelength geoid uh, with topography. These are contours of the geoid uh, superimposed on the topography. And you see there's a very good correlation when you look at either geoid and topography or gravity and topography together, either in the spatial domain or in the spectral domain. What you see is that there, are, there is evidence for different mechanisms of support of topography in different places. For example, these plateaus here correspond to uh, uh, regions that are supported by variations in crustal thickness and or crustal density. These highland regions here um, require dynamic support. And uh, Dan, in fact, in an early paper uh, with Francis Nimmo, estimated lithospheric thicknesses, I think at, just at Atler, right? I think at Atler, um, over these uh, uh, regions that are dynamically um, supported. In addition, these lowland regions are also dynamically supported, so they are interpreted to overlie long wavelength downwellings. And the last, uh, or second to last, um, key, I think, to understanding the current state of Venus are these features called coronae. I mentioned them at the beginning. These are a couple more radar images of different coronae. Um, while they have this commonality, uh, at least in most of the population of this fracture annulus here, they exhibit a wide range of topographic signatures, a wide range of sizes, a wide range of volcanism and associated tectonism. So, so one of the inferences has been that they reflect in some way mantle upwellings, um, but they're clearly not just the product of mantle upwellings. Probably a very important um, contribution to explaining 
the variety of signatures of these features is the melting that's happening um, in producing them. The other thing that's actually very important is that they're concentrated in this region, typically referred to as the BAT region, beta atlathamus region. And in fact, when you look at the gravity signatures of Coroni, what you find, and also geological mapping, uh, what you find is that the population in this region is very likely on average younger uh, than the population of Coroni that are out surrounding these plains regions in here. So this actually points to perhaps um, some dynamics that may be important, dynamics that provide essentially long wavelength dynamical support of these topographic highs here, but that at the same time can produce these really unusual features. One thing that's probably very important about Coroni that we still don't understand is what their contribution to heat loss is on Venus today. And the last uh, thing to just mention here, I won't go into it in any detail, is that even though the impact crater record shows no obvious spatial variations in terms of crater density, and very few of them are modified, there are some signatures of modification <coughs> that suggest, in fact, and these have been look at, looked at um, in detail recently, that suggest that craters may be more modified than we originally thought, particularly evolution of these dark halos that are associated with very fresh um, young craters. And in particular, the uh, craters that appear um, to be unmodified sit in the plains, and there's um, an absence of craters with these dark halos in this beta atlathamus um, region. Again, pointing perhaps to uh, resurfacing or at least uh, differences in that region compared with elsewhere. So I won't go through all of these points in here, but the big question, the big outstanding question for Venus still really is how does it lose its heat today on the Earth? 75%, 70, 75% of the heat loss is through plate tectonics. Really, no matter what you do for Venus, it's hard to escape the conclusion that today its mantle temperature must be increasing. Whether that has been the case for a long time is really, is really not known. But I think that we're starting to get towards um, some pointers that will help us actually understand this question better. So the second um, topic that I wanted to uh, talk about more briefly is Mercury, its early history. And Mercury has been the subject of a recent mission, recent orbital mission from 2011 to 2015, the Messenger mission. And Mercury uh, is a very different place from Venus. Um, again, for those of you that don't think about Mercury every day, it's basically a big iron ball surrounded by a very thin uh, rocky mantle and crust relative to the size of its iron uh, core. It does have a magnetic field today, global magnetic field. It's similar to the Earth's in that it's dipolar. Um, it's more or less axial, um, much weaker than uh, the Earth's present day field. And uh, there is evidence for large impact basins that you don't see, for example, on um, Venus. This is the largest impact basin, Chloris. This is a false color image, so the color tells us something about different compositions of the surface. Lots of nuggets of things that we've learned from Messenger. And I'm going to talk about the last two on this list here because they both pertain to the early history. One is evidence from uh, tectonic features of global contractional strain on the planet. Early in its history, for how long it's persisted, we don't know, but we know the net uh, result of that. Um, and the second is an observation of crustal magnetization on uh, Mercury. And what is important about this is if the crust is magnetized, then it tells you non-uniquely something about the magnetization, so the magnetic minerals, how much of them there is present in the crust, and if you know when it was acquired, something about the magnetic field history, which in turn is a constraint on thermal evolution models. So here's 
basically what the surface of Mercury looks like. It looks either like this on the left or like this on the right, meaning it looks either relatively heavily cratered or relatively less cratered. These relatively less cratered areas have absolute ages that are interpreted to be around 3.1 to 3.8 billion years. So for people who think at all about um, uh, early planetary evolution post what we call late heavy bombardment. And Mariner 10 imaged about half of the surface of Mercury in the 1970s. Messenger um, was then able to image all of the surface. Mariner 10, in fact, uh, discovered or, or revealed in an images these long uh, lobate features, these scarps here that were interpreted as contractional features. Um, there's very little evidence, with the exception of within some uh, uh, impact basins, very little evidence for extension. But Mariner 10 wasn't able to uh, determine whether these were present globally or just in the part of, of uh, Mercury that um, Mariner 10 had been able to image. The interpretation of these features uh, for a long time has been that they reflect early global cooling and contraction of, uh, of the planet. And you can compute from thermal evolution models how much contraction you expect and then compare that um, with observations. MESSENGER has shown that uh, these contractional features exist planet-wide. This is a map of them from the work of Paul Byrne et al. And what you see here is there are regions that are light green uh, with features shown in dark green. And uh, these are regions of these smooth planes. And most of the faults actually occur in these regions of smooth planes. Um, but the smooth planes themselves account for only about a quarter of the surface area of the planet. So one of the suggestions had been that in terms of timing, uh, the features in the smooth planes may just reflect contraction and cooling of lavas extruded. And there are a couple of tests for that. One is they should have accommodated less strain than from global contraction. And the second is that those features should only penetrate a few kilometers into the lithosphere, essentially the thickness of the extruded flows. And I won't talk about those, these two slides in detail, but the take home points from the, from the results um, that my student has been working on is that in fact there is similar strain that is accommodated by the uh, smooth planes and uh, the intercrater planes suggesting that um, contraction preceded the, uh, the extrusion of these smooth planes regions and that the smooth planes faults actually extend quite deep into the crust beneath the layer of volcanics on the surface. The last piece of the story for Mercury is that there is evidence, as I mentioned earlier, for uh, crustal magnetization. Um, this is very, very weak signals, just a few nanoteslas at spacecraft altitude out of a total signal of about 500 nanoteslas, so very difficult to um, detect. And the bottom line from that result was first of all to show in fact that it is crustal magnetization. You look at how the signal attenuates with altitude. And then secondly, to try to determine whether it's induced in the present day field or was acquired in an ancient <coughs> field. And that's a very difficult thing to do when you can't bring a rock home. Um, but one way to try to get at that is to ask the question, can you get a signal of the amplitude that you see today if it's induced in the present day field, because you know the present day field strength. So for plausible mineralities, mineralogies, is that um, a scenario? And the answer to that is yes in some places, but no in other places. And so we think that at least some component of this crustal magnetization was acquired earlier in Mercury's history when we don't know. Um, because there's really no obvious correlation with surface features. But in terms of the types of thermal evolution models that I was talking about earlier, the goal is to try to put all of these different types of observations and constraints, quantitative constraints, 
together um, to be able to use in modeling of planetary evolution. And so in closing, I would say that um, one of the things that is really frustrating about doing non-Earth planetary geophysics is the li all the limited data sets. One of the things that's really fun is having to think really hard about what they mean and combine them. And in terms of what do we really need, I would say for bodies in our own solar system, there's really two key points, maybe three. One is composition, more compositional information. Um, but one is seismic observations where possible. Um, they're the best way, as we know, to image a planet's interior. And the other really is age. Um, samples that we are able to date, even if it's in situ, with large error bars. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. So one or two quick questions for Catherine. I need to ask you, if you're going to ask a question, right, to hold this really close to you because the people who are online elsewhere in the world can't hear too well. Fine. Hugh Rollinson, University of Derby. Are you able to tell us anything about the early history of our own planet, the Earth, inferred from what you've told us here, the Hadean history, the pre-4 billion year history, shall we say? Not directly, no. Um, but I think that one of the one of the more general comment I think is that in looking at other planets, um, we are often surprised by some of the things that we find, and that helps us think outside the box. So one example is Mars as magnetic field. Um, we didn't, we had no. Uh, way before we went to Mars and observed a crustal magnetic field that indicates extremely strongly magnetized rocks to think about that kind of scenario, right? And so I, I think it's in a more general way is enabling us to, to perhaps think differently and more broadly. Yep. One other. Uh, Jim Chalmers, Gaius Copenhagen. Does the high surface temperature on Venus have any effect on uh, heat flow rates through the lithosphere? And if so, does it have any effect on, on uh, tectonism? Right. So the question was about uh, uh, surface temperatures on Mercury? Oh, Venus. On Venus, sorry, on Venus. Um, yes, so one of the, uh, the pre-Magellan um, predictions was, in fact, or a sort of state of understanding was, a, was really being puzzled about how you could sustain topography on Venus because people hadn't realized quite how strong the laboratory work done in Dave Colstead's group hadn't been done on, on dry crustal rocks. And so, in fact, the, the differences in stresses that could be sustained by dry crustal rocks really wasn't appreciated. And so, in fact, Early in the Magellan mission, one of the interpretations was that all of the high topography must be young because it would just flow away. And so it must all be on the order of 10 million years or so. And, and the rheological measurements have indicated that, yes, surface temperature is important, but the uh, absence of volatiles actually trumps surface temperature. Yep. So yep. Thank you very much indeed. We can have more discussion, obviously, at, at the end. So the second talk in this non-Earth uh, <coughs> brief session is by David Waltham from Royal Holloway, University of London. And he's going to talk on the plate tectonics of exoplanets. OK. So I thought it might be fun to in this uh, 50 years of plate tectonics conference, look towards the next 50 years. Um, one thing in particular, the possibility that we might be able to detect plate tectonics on planets around other stars within the next few decades. So I've got two main objectives in the talk. First of all, I want to persuade you that I'm not insane. <laughs> and secondly, I want to persuade you to join me in my insanity. 
because uh, you know, 100 or 200 brains are better than one. So that's where I'm going. Uh, I should start by telling you why you should give a damn about it. Well, I think virtually everybody in this room, perhaps with the single exception of the previous speaker, uh, this is the planet we're most interested in. So why should you care at all about exoplanets and, and about the possibility of plate tectonics on them? Well, quite simply, because it will help to improve our understanding of plate tectonics. And it will enable us to ask, answer, for example, the very questions that were just coming up at the end there about whether plate tectonics is affected by things like water, uh, affected by temperature, and affected by the size uh, of the planet. So those are good reasons, I think. The one that really interests me is actually that last one up there, though. I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with this question. Is the Earth a typical medium-sized rocky planet, or does it actually have a lot of very odd properties that were necessary uh, for habitability? Uh, and plate tectonics is right up there at the top of my list. So that's where I'm coming from, personally. So before I can get on to that, I, I think I should probably tell you the state of the art currently uh, in terms of characterising exoplanets. Uh, and the story only starts 20 years ago uh, with the first uh, planet around a, a normal star, 51 Peg B, and that was discovered using something called the radial velocity method, uh, and the idea here is that as the planet and the star uh, orbit their mutual centre of gravity, the star wobbles a bit, and you can pick that up in a Doppler shift of its spectral lines. And the key thing about this method is it tells you the planet's mass, because uh, the heavier the planet, the more the star wobbles. So that was the uh, first technique. But the most successful technique has actually been the transit method, which I'm showing here. Uh, and the idea here is that for roughly 1 or 2% of planets, their orbits will by chance be aligned such that the planet can pass in front of the star, between us and the star, once per orbit. And as it does so, there will be a slight drop in the brightness of the star as the planet gets in the way. And the size of that drop tells you the size of the planet. So from this, we can get radius. Whilst I've got this um, slide up, another small point I want to make on here, because I'll come back to it later, there's a second small dip, you can see. It's right there. Right, the secondary eclipse as the fully illuminated planet goes behind the star. Right, that is detectable, and I'll come back to that later. So we've got mass, we've got radius. That tells us average density. Uh, and from that, we can start to say something about um, composition. So, for example, we've got a Mercury-like composition, or we've got an Earth-like composition, and so on. So we can pick out the rocky planets, hopefully. Right, we can do much better than that. We can already get spectra of exoplanet atmospheres. Uh, so this, this diagram shows how that's done. There's a transiting planet there, and the key idea is that uh, if the atmosphere is opaque, then the planet looks a little bit bigger than if the, planet, if the atmosphere is transparent. So if you simply plot the depth of the transit versus wavelength, you effectively get an absorption spectrum. Uh, and this has been done. That spectrum up there is from the Hubble Space Telescope in black. And in red is a model spectrum, assuming that that planet has an atmosphere of carbon dioxide, water, and methane. And you can see it's a pretty good fit. And that's an extraordinary achievement, I think. We can also get spectra of the um, reflection from the planet. So rather than absorption through its atmosphere, what does the planet reflect or emit if it's warm enough to actually emit some infrared? And the way you do that is exactly the same. It's the transit depth versus wavelength. But this time, it's for that secondary eclipse that I mentioned earlier, because that's the light that's reflected off the planet. And what this gives you, in addition to the um, composition, is it tells you about temperature. You can see on this example, this is Spitzer telescope data. So again, this is genuine. Uh, and fitted along there are some black body temperature curves. And you can see there are three different curves on there. The reason for that is, depending on the wavelength, you can see to different depths in the atmosphere. So you're actually seeing a temperature profile. You're seeing temperatures and how it changes uh, with altitude. So again, extraordinary that you can do that. Now, at the moment, that can only be done for really large exoplanets, you know, Jupiter-sized bodies. But the next generation of observatories is going to change that. With these observatories, we're going to be able to start looking at at least super-Earths, maybe not down to Earth size, but things that are maybe twice the size of the Earth. 
Uh, so these three observatories, very important. First one, James Webb Space Telescope, that's the replacement for Hubble, um, that will be in operation in less than two years. Uh, the next one there is the European Extremely Large Telescope. It's under construction already, it will be operational in seven years' time. And when they say extremely large, they mean it. This telescope has got an aperture of 39 metres. I think that's significantly larger than this room. Okay, that's its main mirror. It's enormous. There's also the possibility of uh, dedicated space telescopes, dedicated missions. The aerial mission I'm showing there is led by Giovanna Zanetti at UCL, and we will hear next month whether it's been selected by the European Space Agency. It's on a short list of three at the moment. So with these telescopes, we might be able to take things out a little bit further. So what are we going to look for? Or what could we look for if we want to find um, plate tectonics? Well, my first thought was carbon dioxide was the obvious thing to look at. So with the um, silicate weathering cycle, which, where rain washes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, uh, the runoff goes into the ocean and eventually forms carbonate rocks. Those carbonate rocks subduct, uh, get heated up, and they re-emit the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. What this process does, of course, is to wash most of the CO2 out of our atmosphere, but not all of it. But what would happen if we turned off the subduction? Right? Would the CO2 then actually go to zero? So a possible signature of plate tectonics is a planet that's clearly got water and has got some carbon dioxide rather than none, or rather than lots, somewhere between the two. Now, the issue there, that's a little bit vague, and you can see ways in which it might be very hard to interpret. That won't be enough on its own. We need something else. So I scoured the literature to see what I can find, and I came up with this um, from uh, Mikhail and Spurgensky recently, where they looked at the nitrogen abundance in our atmosphere. You can see the blue curve there. That's basically showing that the nitrogen abundance in Earth's atmosphere is significantly higher compared to noble gases than that for um, uh, either Mars or Venus. Uh, and uh, Sammy Mikkel's explanation for that is that it's the result of oxidation caused by subduction. That as the plates subduct, they oxidize the mantle slightly, and that helps to liberate nitrogen from the, uh, from the mantle. So it's a hypothesis at the moment. I think it's a very interesting one. If it's right, then perhaps high nitrogen is another possible signature uh, of plate tectonics. Of course, we have to be careful. The yellow curve there is for Titan. Okay, even higher. So clearly, these things are not going to be unambiguous. So, uh, I'm a bit behind the curve. <laughs> After 50 years of plate tectonics, like, does Earth have plate tectonics? What I'm really getting at here is, could we detect it in spectra of our atmosphere? So this would be an obvious test for the, the techniques. Uh, and we can get spectra of our atmosphere quite easily. Here's one way to do it. If you point a spectroscope at the moon, during a total lunar eclipse, the moon is illuminated there by light that's passed through Earth's atmosphere, and therefore you get a spectrum of our, of our atmosphere. And that's what's being shown here. Uh, and there are uh, the sorts of features that oh, I'm interested in. I'm going to have to use the pointer now. I was told not to. Right, that's water. So we've got water. That's carbon dioxide. But it's not very deep. If you look at the similar spectra for Venus and Mars, they're much deeper. So we've got that, spectra, that, that combination of water and a little bit of carbon dioxide. Nitrogen, well, there's a problem. Uh, to see absorption lines for nitrogen, we need to go way down into the ultraviolet. We haven't got that information there. So we need a broader spectrum for that. We can also get transmission, sorry, reflection and emission spectra from the Earth, also by pointing a spectroscope at the moon. In this case, you point it, whoops, I was told not to do that as well. Point here. <laughs> at the unilluminated part of a crescent moon, because this is actually slightly illuminated by uh, Earth light. It's called Earth shine. So you get a spectrum of light that's been reflected off the Earth that way. And the key things that are in here, apart from the features I've already spotted, uh, talked about, I think the most interesting thing that's in here is this rise here. Right? That's Raleigh scattering from our atmosphere. It's actually scattering from nitrogen molecules. So possibly you start to get some indication there of, of nitrogen. It'd be very hard to model it. Uh, what's also missing is the very long wavelengths. We need those to get temperature signals. So, as my conclusions, uh, this is too wordy. Really, it says, I'm not balmy, and help. Thank you. <laughs>
So thank you very much, Dave. I'm sure there must be many questions out there. Who'd like to have the microphone first? Everyone's silenced. Uh, just there. Yeah, uh, Richard Herbert, um, do you think it's possible to have life on a planet that doesn't have plate tectonics? Uh, I'm doubtful about it, um, partly because of the carbon dioxide problem. Um, but I mean, just in general, the way that it recycles chemicals and keeps the, um, the surface of the earth out of chemical equilibrium, I think is very important. So that's why it's near the top of my, my, my list. And I'm not alone in that, it's, it's widely held. Anyone else? Any more suggestions for what Dave might Please. try to look for? Back row. Hi, Dow van der Meer, Nexon Petroleum. Not looking for oil and gas there, by the way, just to be clear. <laughs> Um, so, uh, about a year ago, there was actually a talk at the Geological Society about uh, uh, what we have learned about Pluto and uh, the possibility of having ice tectonics uh, and, and, uh, and well, volcanoes erupting uh, ice of various uh, methane and other gas compositions. Could you comment on that? And it's maybe also addressed to the previous speaker as well. What can you detect uh, from a distance on the, let's say, the ice, the smaller bodies in within our own solar yeah. system? So, I mean, essentially, the sort of atmospheric signatures of, of things going on in very different environments. I, I mean, there's obviously there are the plumes from Enceladus, which are effectively an atmospheric uh, signature of something going on at depth in Enceladus. Um, Pluto has again a very thin atmosphere as a result of its internal activity. It certainly is true that, yeah, that these kinds of techniques can tell us about subsurface uh, processes on, on other worlds and that therefore we could extend those techniques to exoplanets as well. Uh, but it's not going to be easy. It's, it's, there is so much ambiguity in, in this kind of data. One more. Right, in that case, we will leave non-Earth planets and, and return, if you like, home. Uh, for the first, we've got two talks here on the evolution of continental crust and really the role of, of plate tectonics. And the first talk is on the uh, Paleoproterozoic in, in Brazil and Hugo Morier from the University of Portsmouth. And you have his title here. Thanks, Mary. Right, so I have a short talk, and I'm only going to talk about three things in here. So first of them, of them I'm going to talk about a psychological chemical change that happens in subduction process through the evolution of plate tectonics. Second thing, I'm going to talk about the magmatic gap, the magmatic shutdown. And also I'm going to talk about the Minato belt and how we can use the Minato belt to understand the first two topics. Cool. It has been proposed that tonalites, trondramites, granodiorite magmas, or simply TTG magmas, they evolved to sanukitoid magmas, right? And there are a few ways to explain this transition, this geochemical transition. And one of them I'm showing here is the so-called hot subduction model. And what happens in here, we have a melt of a short-lived mafic source that produces TTG magmas without any interaction with the mantle, right? As Earth cools down and the geothermal conditions of Earth decrease, the subducted slab is, uh, is steeper, and therefore, the deeper it's going to be the melt of such slab. The consequence is an interaction with the mantle, which metasomatizes and produce sanukitoid magmas. Sanukitoid magmas, they have a dual composition, mantle and crustal derived. That's how we split apart those two magmas, right? This model was proposed by Moyen Morton, Martin, actually, in 2012, and it was inferred that this transition represents the onset of subduction in plate tectonics. And here, I have a recent compilation from Halle et al. this year, and as you can see, we have a temporal relationship 
between TTG magmas and Sanukitoid magmas in various Archean provinces in our planet. As you can see at the bottom, there is no record of such transition in the San Francisco Craton in Brazil. Is it because of a bad compilation? Not really. It's a very good compilation, in my opinion. And in fact, in this work from Farina and collaborators in 2015, after a very thorough geochemical study of the basement rocks, he found out, first found out, that there is no sanuctoid magmas in the region. And this, I'm um, showing here this, uh, his data in this uh, Lohan diagram. It's a tenary diagram and can split like TTGs, sanuctoids, hybrid, and two microgranites. Let's keep it in mind, it's going to be important in a minute. So the other thing, the second thing that I have to address in here is the so-called magmatic gap. It's known for a long time that we have this absence of magmatic rocks, magma, juvenile magmatic rocks, between 2.4 and 2.2 billion years ago, right? And here, I'm bringing a compilation of 1,000 zircons from Konzi et al. in 2009. And as you can see, we have like this deficiency of like um, uh, records, of uh, zircon records within this interval in here. So uh, the implications for such uh, absence of ages it's a, a, it can be, for example, a, a lithospheric stagnation. People go further and say there is a slowdown of plate tectonics or even a shutdown of plate tectonics. Cool. Of course, after this publication, these ideas, many occurrences of rocks within this interval have been published. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And this is a very good compilation from Pantin et al. in 2014. And this brings me to Brazil, when, where we have like the San Francisco Craton. If you remember from Pedroza Soares' talk yesterday, the San Francisco Craton has this funny horse head shape in here. And its southern portion, it's composed of uh, Archean blocks, composed of TTGs, potassium granitoids, and greenstone belts. All those Archean bits, they have been put together, amalgamated in the Paleoproterozoic orogeny. And everything you see in pink in here, it was once Paleoproterozoic belt, a Paleoproterozoic belt. But what happens is that we have this Neoproterozoic orogeny that overprints most of the Paleoproterozoic belt. For some reason, this region here was preserved, was shielded from the Neoproterozoic orogeny. Therefore, understanding this region here that we call as Mineiro belt, it's a spectacular area to understand plate tectonics during the Paleoproterozoic. And today, we're going to talk about three rock types. And from now on, they're going to be red, pink, or blue, depending on which one we, we're talking about, right? So here we go. And actually, I'm going to show you this just enlarged map where you can see exactly the localities we have sampled those rocks. The Mineiro belt is huge. It's more than 1,000 kilometers square. Cool. Here we go. The Lagoa Torada Suites, or the red rocks, they are like garnet-bearing, high aluminum tonalites. They were dated to be 2.35 gigan years. Epsilon neodymium for such rocks are very positive, from plus 1 to plus 2.1. Model age for such rocks vary from 2.4 to 2.5 gigan years. They are intermediated rocks. They have low magnesium number and low potassium content. The rare earth element patterns for such rocks are like that. So you can see we have a clear <coughs> positive European anomaly, and we also have a depletion of heavy rare earth elements. Those are characteristics of a TTG magma. Cool. The blue rocks, they are horned blend tonalites, rich in mafic magmatic enclaves. They are also intermediated in composition, they were dated to be 2.113 gigan years or so. Epsilon neogeny values are, in average, zero. And the model age vary from 2.3 to 2.4. The difference relies in here. We have a much higher magnesium number for such rocks, and chromium, strontium, and barium are extremely high for such rocks. Those are characteristics of sanukitoid magmas, right? This is classified as sanukitoid uh, Sweet. The third rock, as we call it, 
uh, miscellaneous stonolites, right? They, they, they have fewer horniblend content and also fewer mafic magmatic enclaves compared to the Sanukitoids, but they also intermediated in composition. They were dated for us to be 2.113 billion years old, most of them. Uh, epsilon neogenic values are slightly lower than the Sanukitoids, so like going until like minus 1.2. TDM age go from 2.3 to 2.5. However, the magnesium number are much lower compared to the Sanukitoids, and the chromium are like sometimes 10 times lower than the Sanukitoids. However, strontium and barium are still really high for such rocks. This is cool because we can split those suites apart easily by the barium strontium diagram. So the TTGs, the red rocks, they rely on here, very lower concentration of such elements, whereas the other two, they have much higher concentration for those two uh, elements. But we cannot say that the pink rocks are sanukitoids because as I told you, they have like uh, lower composition of compatible elements like chromium and magnesium, nickel as well, for example. So that's why we classify them as a high barium strontium suite. And if we plot those those uh, model ages, uh, let's say epsilon neodymium against time diagram for such rocks, we can see that they gently overlap each other through the, the TDM line. It means that those rocks, they have a genetic link. The younger rocks can be generated from the older rocks, the melt of the older rocks. And this is really cool because we establish like the composition and temporal relationship of such rocks. And then I bring back the Lohans diagram, and I show for you that we have a late TTG Sanuktoid transition. And it starts in the Siderian period, which was referred to be as a magmatic shutdown, the magmatic gap. The other thing that we have done to go further in this research. We've done some runulate geochronology of zircons and titanites for such suites, for such rocks. And here I'm showing some cathodoluminescence images for zircons from one of the pink rocks, the miscellaneous tonalites. And as you can see, they describe a, a intercept age, upper intercept age around 2.122 billion years. And we also have used, this was, this, was, uh, this was made by laser ablation ICPMS, but we also did ID teams analysis for similar zircons. You know, ID teams, you consume the whole zircon, right? You dissolve the whole zircon to get an age, but you get much more precise ages. And indeed, we have a very similar age compared to the intercept age I showed for you in the last slide. So the age of crystallization of this rock is 2.120 or so. Uh, billion years old, right? So don't blink right now because we're going to plot the titanites on the same diagram. And these are the titanites, uh, ranulate and titanites we did by laser ablation. And as you can see, within uncertainty, such ages are pretty much the same. They're very similar ages. And we consider those titanites in here as magmatic titanites, mainly because they have this ohedral shape and also inclusions of zircons and apatites hosted by the titanite. Right, and in here, we have a compilation for almost concordant uh, zircons and titanites for all the rocks we have dated in this study. And as you can see, they largely overlap around 2.2 and 2.1 billion years, right? The only exception is the rocks that have ages, zircon ages, at around 2.3. And this is because for all the rocks we found with zircons with ages at 2.3 or older, the titanites have been replaced by humanite, as you can see in the upper right corner of, the, of this slide, right? And the younger ages for those titanites and zircons, we believe they represent like the final collisional stages of the belt against the cratonic margins. So, and to, to sum up the ideas in here, we think we have, this is an oversimplified diagram, we have a melt of short-lived mafic source that produce the TTGs, 
at around 2.35 billion years. This also could be uh, ocean, oceanic plateau, for example, not necessarily island arc, as I'm showing this diagram. And 200 million years later, we have like a, a melt of a deeper portion of uh, a, a mafic source that interacts with the mantle and produces the sanukitoids. The hybrid granites, as they don't have such amount of compatible elements, they would be derived from, from a underplate melting or possibly a subsequent melt of the same source of the sanukitoids composition. Cool. Just to sum up the ideas in here, I've shown you uh, a late psychological chemistry transition from TTG to sanukitoids happening during the Siderium period, and also I showed that zircons and titanites can describe crystallization periods and also uh, the collisional to post-collision stage of the paleoproterozoic belt. Next steps of this research, you're going to do lutetium half in oxygen analysis to determine real crystal growth, and also going to do trace elements in zircons and titanites. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, David Rowley, uh, I'm delighted by your results. Uh, as a reviewer of that Condi et al. paper, mm -hmm. uh, in which they have a non-trivial number of ages within it, they decided th that they wanted just a little bit of plate tectonics. And I didn't understand what that was. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so. Um, Condi's paper is really polite in the terms he described these possible slow down the plate tectonics. So for a few times the paper say, again, I'm telling you, there is some rocks in this period, but they feel in number, right? And the last, the last sentence of the paper is like, this possibly can represent a shutdown of the plate tectonics. I just think it's kind of a snowball thing, and then people start quoting this stuff and, and believing this um, magmatic shutdown. But personally, I, 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 I don't think there is a, a shutdown. Okay, next question. Bruce Eglinton. I think it's essential to also emphasize that the dating techniques are based on zircon-bearing rocks, which effectively means the felsic part of the spectrum, and one's totally ignoring, essentially ignoring the mafic part of the spectrum. Uh, and the other part of it is that there are large... There are subsequently large parts of the Earth that are only now being studied and dated. For instance, the Ray Craton is an extension over about 5,000 kilometers, where the previous dating was from the 50s, the samples from the 50s, with a spacing of approximately one sample every 100 kilometers. Yeah. And uh, they, there's substantially more evidence for 2.3 crust coming out of that type of thing. Yeah, your observations are completely right. And, but these uh, low, as they, 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 nowadays they call it a magmatic low instead of saying a magmatic gap. But your observations are right. But this interpretation is not only based in zircons, that of course has the bias to be more derived from felsic crust. There, is, there are like uh, other evidence based on the, the large abundant iron formations like depositing lake superior types that would involve a quiescence of plate tectonics as well. And also the, the other evidence is based in sulfur isotopes and also uh, a unconformity in the sedimentary basins in roughly the same age. So the, I've just shown it for you like Conzi's co compilation, but of course, the, this, this low, it's known for long, uh, for like uh, before Condi's paper. Uh, Gina Barnes from SOAS and the University of Durham. Um, the, the word Sanukitoid uh, yes. comes from the name of an old province in western Japan, Sanuki, where right. there were uh, andesite generated from the uh, rifting and the emergence or, or the beginning of the subduction of the Philippine plate. And I wonder, I didn't see Japan anywhere in here. Where does it fit within your analysis in terms of both temporal division, because this was 14 million years ago, and in the, se the sequences? Right, I, I know. I'm, I'm using the, the nomenclature, the terminology from um, uh, Moyen and Martin 2012 paper, 40 years of TTG research to define such Sanuki toys. But I know the origin of the name comes from Japan, but uh, the geochemistry is slightly different. Like, the, uh, not sure about which one they call uh, Adakites or Sanuki toys. 
but I'm using the definition from the, the Archean as describing such a variation of rocks. Thank you very much. And finally, we turn to the last keynote in this meeting, uh, Chris Hawksworth, talking about plate tectonics and continental growth. Do we have a little bit of plate tectonics? <laughs> Never. We'll find Never. out. Never. <laughs> thanks, Mary. Uh, thanks very much for being here. I mean, we've heard from other planets about <laughs> they may not have plate tectonics. So it's been a big, big issue about wh when plate tectonics may have started on Earth and whether we can tie down when that happened. The continental geology has had some flack in the last two days, and that's our only record, all right? It's been complex, it's messy. So how do we go back? It's not complete, it's probably biased. There's not many rocks left from early in Earth history and from the Archean. So how are we going to tackle it? And can we, in essence, try and agree a way forward that might be useful? Linking plate tectonics and continental growth is partly that one of the key things about plate tectonics is, of course, you destroy crust. And therefore, the rate of crustal growth must be less when plate tectonics is operating than when it isn't operating. And if you could tie that down, would that be a help? And the second aspect is, always in geology, we have trouble, if you like, upscaling from regional case studies to global models. And again, if we look at what I want to do is look at a bit of both, some regional studies, some um, more global models, and can we find better ways of trying to upscale from the detailed regional studies that give us local evidence to what we will do with that more widely. So this is where some of us started. This is 1951. This is the presidential address to the Geological Society of South Africa. Some of you will remember some old colonial names in there. And by McGregor, who highlighted with this sketch map of Rhodesia, as it was then, of Zimbabwe, this distinctive texture, which has been called all sorts of things from balloon tectonics and various other aspects. But there was a general sense that this didn't look like plate tectonics, and some other kind of tectonics was going on earlier. And here it's a kind of idealized um, sketch of what it may look like. And one thing to bear in mind is whether you think this has been strained at all, because we'll return to that later. <coughs> But this kind of sketch might also have been made of the Pilbara, and it might also be made of um, the Kapfal Kraton as one kind of, of um, a rock, rock, rock association on, on the continental surface. The other comes from um, Mike Daly. And this is, what were people thinking? This was Shackleton in 1973. Mike Daly did his PhD with uh, Robert Shackleton. And in these days, plate tectonics hadn't really got to the continents. So here was these cross-cutting cross belts, so a billion-year-old um, belt coming down here, and then Zambezi at 500, 600 million years going across here. No sense of displacement, no sense of plate tectonics. Were these some kind of vertical structures? And how could we go and have a look? And Mike went off there in his thesis to see if he could improve on that, and he came back at least with a delightful wife, even if plate tectonics didn't change very much immediately. <laughs> but, so that was a success. <laughs> but the other thing it does is that this was mapped out, you know, in significant part. Oh, sorry, in significant part on. Um, Rock structures and deformations and uh, lineations and things could be mapped out on the surface. And it led us to an interest in, if we were looking at seismic anisotropy, would we get fabrics that would help um, clarify these kind of discussions? To change scales, then there's a lot of discussion about when and how the continental crust formed. It's important for when we know there's enough crust available to erode to, invert, to change the atmosphere. It's important for models of mantle evolution about when we took crust out and how we did that, and what was the composition of the crust. And many of these discussions are sort of held around diagrams like this. So this is time on the bottom, 4.5 billion years to the present day. And this is 100% is the present volume of the continental crust. And clearly, a change of slope on here is a change of the rate at which the crust is growing. And we'll come back to that also. But what I want to highlight here is there are three kinds of curves on here. The brown ones are, in essence, the ages of rocks on the surface of the Earth. So this is from Goodwin, and that basically says that half the rocks on the surface of the Earth are less than 600 million years old, which we all sort of know. Hurley and Rand did the same thing, trying to take basement provinces. And then Alec and 
Condi had the same approach but tried to use model ages, all right, for hafnium or for neodymium, it doesn't matter. So these were when the rocks of the crust were derived from the mantle. And that would imply that maybe half the rocks in the crust had been derived from the mantle by two billion years. Now, both those sets of curves, the brown and the green, are about present-day distributions of rocks of different ages and their proportions. And if you stop and think about it, it's sort of maybe a bit unexpected if the present-day distribution of rocks of different age mirrors faithfully when volumes of crust of different age were generated through Earth history. And what the other models therefore do, all in red and doing various arguments we'll come back to, is that they try and develop models of the volumes of continental crust that were there in different periods of Earth history, which are not there now. And that's, in a sense, nicely historically illustrated by comparing this Armstrong model, which made a lot of crust by four billion years or so, compared to these more intermediate models, which Steve Morbath knows at the time, big debate in the 1980s, uh, were, were discussing and were supportive of. And in essence, Armstrong was keen to push this model because you made lots of crust early in Earth history, but because plate tectonics were so efficient, you could destroy that crust and it, and it wouldn't survive. And interestingly, Stephen Morbath and his colleagues who liked this intermediate one were a little bit wary of destroying too much continental crust when you'd made it. So that, if you like, was the plate tectonic legacy that came into this debate. All right, what will we touch on today? So here's a very brief outline. In the background is the core of the Damara Pan-African belt, where at the core of the present day, you have granulated facies in situ melting to make Alaskites. So that's the core of an area of thick and continental crust of the kind that we're working in. We can look at the distribution of uranium lead ages. We can think about global cycles. We can touch briefly on regional studies that touch on tectonics, metamorphism, <coughs> and isotropy and geochemistry, and then pull out to bigger scale models on the composition of the crust and what changes took place around three billion years. And did that signify the, the start of plate tectonics as a dominant uh, site of crust generation? This has been touched on already, but this is, there are hundreds and thousands of zircon analyses, many of them detrital, all right? So they're thought to have sampled their source areas reasonably well. They're plotted age on the bottom, through to 4.5, <coughs> present day, Hafnium isotopes up the side. Basically, up at the top here would be derived from the mantle, and down here would be increasingly reworking pre existing crust. And Hutton gets a mention simply because most of these rocks, because they're zircons and because they're from felsic materials, are clearly derived from pre existing crustal rocks. So that's a limitation as you try and do some of these discussions. But the thing that is much more striking, and it's shown here as a sort of histogram type distribution along the bottom, is that the distribution of ages through these hundreds of thousands of zircons derived from all over the world has peaks and troughs. And, you know, how come? I mean, each dot on that diagram, in a sense, is making a granite. All right? It's making a magma that crystallizes zircon that eroded to a sediment and somebody picked it up. So this, this sense of a time of lots of granite and a time of less, a time of lots, a time of less, is not what was expected in the steady state plate tectonic Earth. So how come? Is that a primary signal? If so, it might be plumes. Or is it some kind of secondary signal, which is what we would interpret it as, reflecting instead tectonics? And this is a much more simplified version, just to make another point. So this is the same kind of thing. This is number against the histogram present day out to four billion years or so, and it's an early study from Australia by Campbell and Allen, showing peaks of zircons again. And on top of that, it has Mike Brown's stuff about the ages of different fascias of metamorphism. But these ages of metamorphic granulites also cluster with the zircon ages crudely. And surprisingly, again, they coincide with the estimates people have for the time of making supercontinents. Supercontinents have, or old ones, have a slightly shady press, and we can come back to whether that's significant. But it's very striking that whether we believe in supercontinents back that far in time or not, that these peaks of ages, as seen in the zircon record and on the previous slide, match up with the time of forming of those supercontinents. Now, we were struck a while ago now by, if you look at the present day, 
And you look at how magmas are generated along subduction zones like the Western US and uh, South America. The volumes of magma generated roughly match up with the volumes of crust destroyed per year per kilometer. So these are sites of huge magmatism relatively, but sites where you destroy crust as fast as you make it. So it's to get our heads around, making, vol making igneous rocks is great, but what chance have they of surviving? And in contrast, of course, if you go to your favorite collision belt, you will trap not only the last stage of subduction in the late stage island arc subduction sequences, but also whatever magmatism you want to have once you've had collision. So you can evolve a sort of cartoon, if you like, about how peaks of ages might match up with the timing of supercontinents. So this is a very sketch diagram. This is time through here, so the subduction phase, the collision phase, the breakup phase. And this simply plots in you know, relative volumes that we might consider. And the blue curve is magma volumes generated. So it's high in subduction zones, tails off as you have the end of subduction into collision bait magnetism, you have a little on breakup. But the chance of keeping the subduction stuff is low. The preservation potential is low. When you go into collision, you trap this stuff much better. You trap this very well, but there's not much of it, and you have breakup. So you can develop a model whereby the peaks of ages on this thing reflect either the supercontinents on that scale or simply a time of collision, if collision was happening more frequently at some times than others. So, that, so in this sense, we would interpret the link between peaks of ages and supercontinents as linking up with the better preservation potential magmas have when you have tectonic collision than when you don't. If we try and put those together then, just as a sort of summary of where we are, this is a uh, same sort of diagram. Oh, sorry. Same sort of diagram along the bottom here, 4.5 through the present day. Here's your zircon peaks matching up again with the ages of supercontinents. And on top of that, then, there are these smoother curves of what people want to do in terms of developing models for when and how continental crust form through time, as we've already seen. So you have these spikes of ages preserved in your record, which we think are tectonically biased. And then on top of that, we want to see how we can develop uh, these smoother curves for the generation of crust. And what that would mean is that since the peaks of ages started, you had a bias, maybe because of supercontinents, but at least, as I'll show you in the next slide, because of crustal reworking and crustal thickening. And before that, I mean, there, in a way, not that many zircons. It's hard to prove a bias. So I, think, I don't think you can do much before that. And the other point simply to make is that some people have argued that supercontinents might be times of crustal growth. They may well be times of crustal growth, but that would simply be in our model because that's the time that you kept more of the crust you made. It wasn't a time you had to make more crust. So that is, again, a preservation issue. But let me just re-look at that same point with one other slide, and that is what the other thing you can do with zircon data you, is that you can, for every age, you can work out the balance of pre-existing crustal material and relatively new crustal material, and you can plot the percent of crustal reworking through time. And roughly, these are peaks and troughs that don't coincide badly, either with the supercontinents, but more particularly with the ages of the peaks of zircons in the global distribution. So if crustal reworking happens in response to crustal thickening, and crustal thickening happens in response to compression, and you would like to start plate tectonics there, which is a big if, right? Then you would have an argument that said this crustal reworking signals again start at the end of the Archean at around 2.8 or so, whether or not you believe in supercontinents. But they are global signals, and we have to take that on board. All right, let's switch scales then to go to regional things very briefly. Here, and just try and see what we can pick up from regional studies. So here is a sketch map of the Pilbara. Here's one of the strong deformation fabrics in the Eastern Superior. One of the concerns, you know, to geologists in general is whether you can make these domal structures in areas of crustal thickening. And clearly, if you go to the Alps, 
And luckily, I don't know enough about the Himalayas to draw this kind of diagram, but I'm sure it's even bigger in the Himalayas. But if you go to the Alps, you might say, maybe in that blue box, you will end up with a domal structure that doesn't look different from that. But this scale is the same as that scale, and this will give you an area of perhaps a sixth of the area of the Pilbara. But maybe you could do it somewhere else in the Himalayas and make that work. But what about metamorphism? So here's a PT plot. Here's just a sketch map of the Pilbara. Here's the Alps again. And what this highlights is that most of the rocks of Barbot in the Pilbara have present day, the present day surface rocks have, apparently under isostatic equilibrium, have these kind of low pressures and relatively low temperatures. And the comparison, it seems to me, that's important to make is to compare those with, the, if you like, the isostatic equilibrium record of the Alps, the Himalayas, or in this case, the Damara. So eroded collision zones and the Damara will plot over here at significantly higher temperatures once they get down to low pressure. So it seems that metamorphically, it's quite hard to argue that the, that the areas of rocks with these kind of textures, all right, with a relatively low metamorphic grade, as in the Pilbara and the Capfall, are in response to crustal thickening. And they appear instead to be relatively low uh, temperature, low pressure, areas dominated by vertical tectonics. The next thing then, and Mike Kendall introduced this yesterday, is seismic anisotropy, and what can we see from it? And in a way, this was whether, if we went to old areas, we could see fabrics uh, that we might relate to surface geology. And, uh, and in terms, I think we don't need to go through all that again, but it's just to highlight all right, the, the spitting parameters and the time difference here between fast and slow shear waves. What's very different is that the time difference is big um, in comparing Canada and the Superior Province to Southern Africa. But if we go to the Superior Province, here's a field map of the regional geology. Uh, the, that's the bottom of the Hudson Bay. Here's the bottom of Hudson Bay, Superior, Lake Superior. Apologies, this projection is slightly different. Clearly, these lines don't match up with those. But it gives you a sense that while you have this strong regional fabric on the surface in the geology, which effectively is late Archean in age, if you do seismic anisotropy studies, you get a strong fabric, when you, if you make this parallel to that, that's roughly parallel to the fabric of the surface geology. And the splitting time there is up, up over two seconds quite often. So this is a strong feature that we can see. If we then go to Southern Africa, and this is from uh, Silver's data in 2004, and he was interested in mafic intrusions and how they matched up. But here's a map of the uh, Kapfal area. Here's Zimbabwe up here. Here's the Great Dyke again for reference. And Silver and Hal were interested in this fabric and what it might mean. And because it lined up with the Great Dyke, they thought maybe this was a late Archean, Asia Great Dyke kind of fabric. And that was why I asked you earlier about whether you think Zimbabwe, as drawn by McGregor, had been squashed slightly, because this fabric may be there in the mantle lithosphere underneath, if you believe these arguments. But what interested us more than there was a fabric in some places was that if you went to the Capfell, where you had, in a sense, basin and dome structures, a sense of low temperatures, a sense of vertical tectonics, you didn't see a fabric. And it's a question whether this is a useful way forward as we try and document areas of strong fabric. Can we date them and areas from without such fabrics? And the final regional case study uh, bit to add is sort of a tiny bit of geochemistry without any geochemical data, which will encourage some of you. So here is just a plot from 3.8 through to 2.6 for different rock suites that have been studied by geochemists and have used trace element ratios that are similar or different to subduction-related rocks at the present day, or look for boninites, and concluded on that basis that there are areas like uh, Eastern Superior here and like Greenland where there's a strong subduction signal and the Pilbara and there are other areas of Canada one could plot in here. But there are also areas at the similar kind of ages, all right? <laughs> partly in green, but, but certainly in the Pilbara and the Barbwood and in Zimbabwe that we've seen, where there's no sense in the geochemistry of the rocks of a subduction-related signal. Without nitpicking all those studies and saying, are they all right, if we take them at face value, it presumably implies that we have a period of time where in different parts of the world, Pilbara, Southern Africa, things were intraplate, 
Elsewhere in the world, at roughly the same time, things were subduction-related. It seems hard to avoid the fact that between 3.8 and 2.8, there was both subduction-related magmas going on and intraplate magmas. And the issue is which is the dominant one for making crust. Clearly, at the present day, both go on, but we, we know which one is dominant in making crust. The second aspect of this, then, is whether this kind of intraplate material is traditionally then associated with this kind of tectonics. This kind of strong fabric is at least partly quite late in the, in the Archean in age, but, so, but some of the rocks are these kind of rocks here, which were subduction related at 3.8. And one of the issues is how well we can unpick that stronger regional fabric to be of different ages rather than just late Archean, which is the areas that we most often see. All right, then I'm going, there's a four case studies, if you like, locally. Plate tectonics are within plate going on together. Deformation, when we see it strongly, tending towards the end of the Archean. Barberton, uh, Pilbara, areas of vertical tectonics with a within plate signal. Can we take it one other global way forward? And that is, what's the composition of new continental crust? So here is the eroded damera again. So this is a Pan-African belt, granites and gneisses, 500 million years old, eroded into what I would call molasses. It's probably not strictly molasses, but it is where the, continent, the mountain belt has been eroded, and it's the kind of record we get. So as we walked around the upper crust and sampled granites and sediments, we see, we see material that has been reworked, all right, and is hard to take back to the composition of new crust. What we want to do is to get back here to the composition of new continental crust and see if we can get a handle on what, what it looks like and how that may have changed with time. And to do that, all we're going to do is take material from sediments and from granites up and near the surface and anything we get our hands on. We know its crystallization age and calculate its model age, which is the time its source came out of the mantle, and calculate, therefore, the rubidium strontium ratio of this material. And that's all we do here. And why do we do rubidium strontium ratio? Why? Because rubidium strontium ratio correlates wonderfully with silica in recent volcanic rocks. So it gives you a handle on what that is. If you want to see how the calculation works, this is strontium isotopes against time, 4.5 to the present. This is the crystallization age. Here's the model age. And the RBSR ratio of the source is the RBSR ratio required to generate this initial ratio from this mantle value at the time, in the time available. And that gives you the RBSR ratio of the source, which is conceptually of new continental crust. And this was uh, published a year or two ago. It's on 13,000 rocks, scan, you know, taken from the literature. It absolutely shouldn't work at all, but somehow it did. So this is the rubidium strontium ratio, all right, of the source of the materials that were analyzed between their model neodymium age and their crystallization age, plotted against their model age, which is new crust formation age. And what is striking is if you take the pink line as a sort of running meat on the median, um, as just to keep, take the eye, until 3 billion years or so, that line has the same rubidium strontium ratio as the mantle. All right, it's 0 0.03. It has a silica value of that kind of RBSR of 47%, 48% silica as the composition of new crust. And since then, that value of RBSR has gone up, the value of silica has gone up, all right? And you've got more and more intermediate in composition through to a maximum in the Proterozoic before the present day. So there's a big change in the chemistry of the new, of new continental crust at that time. And if you allow one more step to the argument, RBSR in the South Americas correlates wonderfully with crustal thickness for perfectly good reasons. If you want to get basalt through the crust, have it thin. If you want it to differentiate a lot, have it thick and hard to get through. And if you take this correlation and Put it on that RBSR plot, your time since the present, your juvenile continental crust at the time of crust generation goes from about 20 kilometers at 3 billion years up to 40 kilometers by 1 billion years. So that is a way, maybe, of getting some handle on the, how those things have changed. And the final one I'll look at then is this change in slope, which I touched on earlier, in the volume of the continental crust through time. So this is present day, this is 4.5. This curve is from zircons from Dream et al. This curve is from uh, neodymium in shales remodeled by Dream et al. And this Pujol et al. is uh, an argument on um, argon variations in the Archean. The, the changes that happen here 
are firstly this change in slope. Secondly, the onset Shire and people have pointed out that if you look at ectoglyph inclusions in diamonds, they're all younger than 3 billion years. If they re reflect recycled basalt, that happens from 3 billion years. MGO con in the upper crust changes. We've seen the change in RBSR. We've argued that there's an increased seismic anisotropy as you end up with that late Archean phase, and we don't know how far back that goes. And we critically see a reduction in crustal growth rates. And if the reduction in crustal growth rates is easiest to model, not by saying we made crust at hugely different rates back here to here, but mostly by saying once we got here, we destroyed it much more efficiently, because this is when plate tectonics took over and was dominant, even though some subduction and within plate magnetism took place along here. So in summary, the kind of things we've touched on are links between vertical tectonics and within plate magnetism in the Archean. The fact there's a regional distribution, i.e. in the northern hemisphere now, not the southern hemisphere now, the subduction rate of magnetism. Strong regional deformation fabrics by the late Archean, maybe earlier. A reduction in crustal growth rate. At three billion years, plate tectonics becoming the dominant for crust generation. And we didn't touch <coughs> on generated prototypes, but we can come back to it. So this is some kind of time progression drawn by Steve Foley a long time ago which basically shows that by the end, by three billion years or so, you've changed from some kind of within plate and local subduction um, uh, magmatic sequences into a time when the stronger fabrics developed and crust generation was much more strongly linked to um, subduction zone and plate tectonics. Thanks for your time. Questions for Chris? Yeah. Uh, David Latin. Chris, yeah. uh, thanks very much. That's very interesting. I, I was struck by the rollover at the end of your RBSR yeah. plot. What, what's causing that, do you think? Okay. Um, the, the rollover of the RBSR, I mean, there are two aspects, right? If, if you take the thickness argument, and if you take the argument that thickness is a proxy for volume, you can argue that the crust was thicker that there was more crust in the late Proterozoic than since. And two arguments have been put forward. One is there are continental geodynamicists who would say there's a kind of upper level of crust height and then you'll erode it, all right? So there's a thickness and then it'll go back. Or, and it seems to me more likely perhaps, a billion years or soon thereafter is when sort of, if you like, cold subduction started. And if cold subduction is much better at destroying crust than hot subduction, perhaps to be proved, then, we, since then, we may have been destroying crust faster than we made it. But they're untested, slightly glib, but that's as good as we do for now. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, David Rowley. I'll just point out that uh, we have a recent paper that uh, computes that about 2% of the continental surface area has disappeared in Tibet or underneath Tibet in the last 56 million years. 2%. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll register that. Okay, yeah, thanks. Anyone else? Randall, <clears throat> Randall Stevenson. I'm just wondering what the link is between what you're saying about crustal growth and continental mantle lithosphere formation through time. Yeah. And it's hard to shake off all prejudices, right? But, but I, I think there are, there are two things. One of the things I think we now know about the cratonic prototypes, as from Archean areas, is that they appear to have been generated re relatively hot and shallow, sort of i.e. Out, out in the oceans, and, and in a way were swept in here at, in the time that I'm calling three billion years ish or so, all right? So that link between that bit of mantle and the overlying crust is sort of broken in a way that I historically wasn't brought up to think. But anyway, if that's true, that, I think that happens. But otherwise, I don't have much evidence for old bits of lithosphere under young bits of crust. So I think they're linked. They go together. Yeah. And actually, it reminds me that I can move away from this and I can do a tiny bit of advertising. So if anyone wants to follow this debate up, then there's a Royal Society meeting at the end of March on Earth Dynamics and Development of Plate Tectonics. So the next question from Bruce Ecklington. Hi, Chris. Yeah. The, the, the schematic diagram you had looking at crust generation and crust destruction, uh, effectively, if you're working with detrital zircons, that's not 
that's effectively measuring a large part of the of the crust that you are destroying. Yep. So you're almost decoupling, in a sense, the crust generation part of your data set from the crust destruction side. Yeah. I'm wondering if you've had, a, if you've thought of trying to model that through that process. No, no, we haven't in any detail. I mean, I, I think there are two. Yeah, there are two things. Average composition of the crust: 61% silica. Not bad for zircons. Okay. So, so it's a question of the proportions of the material that's made that gets recycled, which we can't get a handle on. But one has to be wary in places like the Andes. Sorry, wary in places like the Andes. I mean, there are arguments that says the residence time of copper ores is 100 million years or so. So, so you're making crust, which by the time it gets to the top is quite felsic, yeah? And over some period of time, you are destroying stuff, much of which must be deeper, all right? So I think they will go on together, even if I can't quantify them. Anyone else for questions to Chris? Dixon Cunningham. I'm going to ask the most simple question that I've thought a lot about. What is your vision of Earth's first subduction zone? What changed? <laughs> all, all, all will become clear. Uh, I, I don't think you're asking the right person, really. Because um, it, it seems to me we get caught up when... If, if... I think there are two things. One is whether it's important to have water in the mantle in order for plate tectonics to take place, in which case... If you get the water from subduction, then you're into a bit of a vicious loop, unless you're going to hang on to stuff that wasn't outgassed. All right? Um, otherwise, yeah, I mean, I would be arm-waving, so I don't have any. But I think what's interesting, if you show this to modelers, that they will say, in a way, a phase of transient plate tectonics, which would go on in some places and not others, is a good way to move forward to the whole thing becoming dominantly plate tectonics. All right? Which is not an answer, but is you know the way I'm thinking. Maybe we should uh, now open discussion up. Does anyone have questions for any of the other three speakers in this session? So, are the planets in our solar system exoplanets? Uh, Brazilian uh, Brazil and magnetism. Graham Yielding, I have a question which is really for anybody. Um, can you have plate tectonics without water? I mean, other people say not, all right? But I'm, and I'm not the one qualified to judge that very well. I mean, geophysicists may much have a much stronger view than I do. Who'd like to take a stab at answering, can you have, do you need water? Dan. Our only hold is Venus. Right. Uh, I agree with what Catherine said. Right. Uh, that some of those features on the surface of Venus look to me as if they've been produced by processes like the plate tectonics on Earth. The thing she, which she didn't say, as I remember, is that if you condense the amount of water in Venus atmosphere to make an ocean, your ocean, as I remember, is five centimeters thick. Catherine, would you like to comment on that? Sure, that's right. I, I, is this on? It's on. Um, I didn't talk about the uh, D to H ratio, right, in the atmosphere, which Venus's atmosphere indicates that, in fact, Venus has lost water over its history. And those are, I think some people would say more than that, Dan, right? I think some people had couple of meters, but uh, oh, it's not. <laughs> the bottom line is not very much. <laughs> I mean, I think to my mind, it, this is not, well, this is not something that I work on, but, but to my mind, one of the real areas that I think that we, from a modeling perspective in geophysics, need to progress in is really understanding um, not just how to incorporate lithospheric rheologies into mantle convection models so that we can correctly m simulate breaking of plates, but actually really understanding how 
um, how annealing might work and how how what the feedback is between uh, a previous deformation and later deformation. And there's a there's a little bit of work in that now in the mantle convection community. Um, but I think that one of the things that that they're seeing, so this is the work of O'Neill and, and people like Adrian Lenardic, is that the feedback is really important in terms of determining that there isn't just one uh, critical level of uh, convective stresses for a given planet that will actually give you lithospheric failure. It, that, that depends also on the history of deformation. I think there's a real problem in in trying to do such calculations because the stress is involved in, for instance, an earthquake like Tohoku, right, are about half a, a, a megapascal. We know perfectly well from the gravity anomalies that parts of the Earth will sustain 300 megapascals. So what is actually causing that? I think it has to be fluid and water, right, which is going down the subduction zone. The thickness of the layer involved is probably meters, right, which just does the lubrication. How in the world are you going to incorporate the dynamics and the compaction and two-phase flow of regions which are no more than, than, than a meter or so into your global calculations? And what people have done so far is just to introduce arbitrarily uh, s free surfaces. And that, of course, makes your plate tectonics. But that's exactly what you're trying to study, is what makes those things. And it seems to me a really miserable thing to try and do right, because of the resolution. Right? I mean, I just don't see how you attack it. We don't understand what's going on. We don't understand the processes on these things. I think we have to be in a sense, less ambitious. We have to tackle those things which are tackleable rather than those things we'd like to know the answers to. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have anything to add to that? <laughs> or is there anything else that, again, for, for any other speaker, anyone would like to ask? John Brenner. <clears throat> Could I ask the water question in a slightly different way? Um, how much water do we think was there very early on, let's say at the end of the Hadean? Um, and how widely spread was it? Was the land sticking up through it, or was most of, or perhaps all of the land submerged? I, I don't know the answer, but I'm interested to know if anyone does. I mean, I think most interpretations of strontium isotope variations in seawater and so on would say that you're not, going, you're not having much continental crust, relatively high BRBSR, it would be uh, contributing to seawater until middle to late Archean. All right, so to that extent, there isn't much, there may not be much material above sea level earlier than that. But well, there's plenty of water. Oh, there's plenty of water. Yes, no, it's a question of how, how many heads are above it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if there's plenty of water and not much land above the water yeah. surface, then surely it affects your calculations as to how much um, rock was eroding and going down into sediments. Yes, but we don't get to do that till later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. So that's why it doesn't work. And one of the, I mean... One of the interesting things about the Archean, all right, is that there, as my memory is, there are almost no S-type granites, so there are no melts of sediments. And if you look at oxygen isotopes and zircons, none of the zircons come from melts that melted a sediment. So either you didn't have, crustal th you didn't have any crustal thickening, because that would be a way to do it, because you hadn't got compressive tectonics, or somehow there was something odd about the sedimentary record there. But clearly there are greenstone belts with surface um, sediments through to 3.7, 3.8, I don't know, off, um, off yeah. But uh, we don't know how widespread they were. A, a related point to that is um, people like Warren Hamilton have said that very early on, um, the Earth's surface was n not sufficiently stiff 
uh, to have high relief, yeah. therefore very low relief. Therefore, a modest amount of water would have given you virtually worldwide oceans. And there was seen to be an argument that, that the world was very much ocean covered, whether it's salt water or fresh water is, is a minor detail. Um, and that surely would affect the uh, overall assessment as, oh. to how, as, as to how much uh, sedimented material there was, therefore raw material for making granites and such like. Yeah. yeah. It, it's a perfect, I mean, saying the lithosphere was too weak is, a, is, a, is another way to say that's why there were no, there was no thickening to make mountains that would then melt inside them and erode. So, so you can put those two stories together. It's hard to separate the two. Uh, Stephen Robertson, a question for Catherine. Um, could you say a little bit more about what our present understanding of the Caroni on Venus is? Um, because uh, um, Warren Hamilton, for example, uh, made a vigorous argument that these were impact structures, but perhaps that's now an out-of-date or disproved notion. Uh, I, th I think that Warren probably stands mostly alone in that interpretation. Uh, they, they, for most of us who would look at uh, images of planets, they are clearly not impact structures. They don't have imp they don't have any of the characteristics of impact structures apart from the fact that they're kind of circular. And in fact, they're less circular than most impact structures. So they don't show evidence for ejecta for, for impact structures you would typically see on other planets without erosion. Uh, you would see, you see the ejecta very clearly. Uh, you see, in fact, it's very unusual for an impact structure to be um, really not circular, so elliptical at all, and s many of these structures are somewhat elliptical. They have... So that's, that's what they're not. What right. Are they? What are they? Okay, so um, we don't know. Uh, we know. We know that they possess uh, both tectonic and magmatic characteristics, and as I described, I think the big puzzle for a long time was the wide variety of, of sizes and of extent of magmatism and extent of tectonism within them. Um, it's very difficult in the absence of uh, any kind of um, age information uh, to be able to do anything other than um, looking at relative superpositions of them. Because of the uh, extensive magmatism and volcanism associated with many of them, and because of the topographic profiles and the associated gravity signatures, most people would, I think, would agree that uh, they are the product of mantle upwellings. At what scale, we really don't know. Um, is it, are these upwellings that are, um, they're, they're probably transient because we see this wide variety of structures. But uh, to my mind, the thing that probably governs the variety among these different structures is in fact the extent of melting that's happened as a result of upwelling. Right, thank you very much for that. I think we have to draw the discussion to a close now. Uh, we obviously need to thank all the speakers from this session and indeed the organizers of these three days of, of talks. Thank you. Thank you.